Tales of the Legion Project podcast, remembering Keith Giffen. The only comment I got in the Legion was when I met Kurt Swan uh, for the first time. I said I was doing the Legion, and he looked at me and said, you must be insane, and walked off. It was not, look, the Legion was not exactly the most popular book to um, to do then, because of like 26 individual members, and and, and I came on the Legion, I played nice for a while, and I decided I started changing costumes around until finally when um, I did the Five Years Later Legion, I just did it completely my way. I looked at the Legion, and I thought, well, they're teenagers, and they've been teenagers for close to 25, 30 years. So I just moved some of them up in age, and when you move them up in age, then you have to... Uh, deal with development and all and just i aged them i aged them and gave them um what i thought were unique personalities but they were really just extrapolations of the personalities they were already given hello and welcome to the 16th episode of the tales of the legion project podcast i am your host eric and i'm peter and as uh as i as i mentioned um we're here to discuss uh the late great keith giffen who died on October 9th, 2023, at the age of 70. Um, he would have turned 71 um, next month, at the end of next month, mm -hmm. uh, as we record this right now. So, at, uh, so yeah, Peter and I wanted to get together and um, talk about Keith Giffen and his importance to us. I mean, he has a, a huge, uh, 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 imp he was a huge impact on, uh, I think both of us in terms of our Legion history, but sure. there's so much more to him and uh, his work and what he contributed. And uh, so this was, this was uh, our way of, of like, like we said, remembering him. Right. And we wanted to do this episode because we already recorded uh, an episode the day before the news broke. So we're recording this on uh, Friday, October 13th. <laughs> oh gosh um, yeah the news broke on the 11th it is also new york comic-con this weekend so mm. eric and i we got together on tuesday we recorded uh the next episode you're going to hear which is uh, legion of the legion project episode 43 the second part of the millennium crossover with laurel with laurel kent um and in that episode we we just do our normal episode so you know i felt like we didn't want to put that episode out almost a week and a half from when we recorded it without any mention of keith giffen and everybody might have thought well wow you know did they not want to you know so anyway so the point is we're recording this episode we're going to put this one out before that episode and then that way, you know, that, um, you know, it's not like, obviously, we're not ignoring any news or that we didn't want to, uh, you know, I didn't want to just put like a little disclaimer and say, you know, oh, we'll get to it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. let's just let's just do it now. I think everybody's going to do this now. And and between Twitter and Instagram, there really are just uh, people really came out and um uh, collaborators i mean you know one of the first ones um that i saw right away uh when they announced this was colleen doran same because yeah, she she right away wrote again we're coming up on this is new york comic-con weekend i hope every panel started with like we need 30 seconds of a remembrance yeah. you know i hope his name was constantly spoken during that convention certainly probably the creators did you know especially the ones that knew him um rafael albuquerque if you know his his artwork if you know that creator he says uh, really sad to hear about the passing of the great keith giffen i had the honor to begin my career working with him in jeremiah harm for boom studios and he brought me to blue beetle later that year uh, and he talks about, you know, he loved his work as a kid. And and that's not even the only, that's two creators so far that talked about he was like their driving force when they first, and, and there's more, I can find more, but you mm -hmm. know, if you want to, do you want to talk about some other creators and I'll look for some other ones here. 
Well, just to start off with, um, it, when you mentioned the Colleen Duran tweet, I remember that day when it, when I, you know, I just would just happen to pull up Twitter and, 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 uh, there's that post by her. I'm like, Oh no. And then I saw, and I'm like, I have to, I have to look at this up. Cause I, I gotta, I gotta find out what's going on. Cause you know, she wasn't, uh, the post I saw the first post of hers that I saw, it wasn't explicit. It was, it suggested that he was gone. And, and I, like I said, I wasn't sure. And then I saw your post. <laughs> Um, and so I, then I knew, but, um, uh, let's see here. Well, uh, JM, uh, De Mateus, um, uh, you know, one of his collab longtime collaborators, uh, you know, uh, talking about how he, he, he was one of the most brilliantly creative humans I've ever known. And this is that curmudgeon thing again, curmudgeon with a heart of gold, uh, a generous collaborator. And that was something that I have noticed in, in, uh, people talking about him or mm -hmm. the interviews that I, that I, uh, 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 have been reading, you know, is that, you know, uh, you know, they would be doing, you know, maybe some scripting or dialogue or whatever, uh, even though he was coming up with pretty much everything, but he would, he would put their names on stuff with him, you know, and he was, he was just like that. He was just very, like, like, uh, JM said, a generous collaborator. Um, uh, I, I and I love this, uh, as J.M. De Mateus' wife observed, he was like a character out of a Keith Giffen story. <laughs> I just thought that was fabulous. Uh, Phil Hester, someone at DC once gave me my gave him my phone number in error. Though it was a wrong number, we wound up just talking comics for half an hour. <laughs> and and, I, and there was somebody else that that he that uh, not that it was a wrong number, but they were talking and and it's just like. Uh, they, they commented how Keith, I think maybe they met at a, at a con or whatever. And um, Keith talked to the guy for like an hour, like they were old friends and they, oh, you know, they Colin didn't really Bunn. know it was, yeah, Colin Bunn. Okay. It's just like, you know, what, a, what, a, what, a, he sounds like a really great guy. So uh, Derek Robertson, you know, him from like trans metropolitan and um, um, he's done a bunch of, you know, comics and, and um I'm forget he just did like a bunch of like Justice League miniseries, but he said, uh, my very first assignments at DC were working with Keith and J.M. DeMatteis. Keith used to do these brilliant breakdowns instead of just writing out a page, and I learned so much about storytelling from working with him. I was lucky to work with Keith again on The Authority back in 2009. I was reading the script for issue number three when I came across this in Keith's words, to the creative team and then they, he cuts to the script and keith writes yes there's a reason i'm not breaking down the action beats our esteemed artist doesn't need me getting in his way so it's going to be things i need to happen paste as Derek sees fit i'll slot in any small word balloons needed for clarity of situation based on the visuals and then Derek uh, con continues Considering where I'd started and what a huge fan I am of his, this trust meant the world to me. He was a brilliant creator and designer, a true original, and will not see his like anytime soon. And I've read that from some other creators too, where they're like, he just said, okay, there you go. Go do what you need to do. And then I'll come back in and write it. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just stopped on this one. This is from Chris Burnham. Uh, I'm looking forward to rereading and re rereading trencher lobo the heckler the legion trencher l-e-g-i-o-n j-l-a and trencher for the rest of my life and he uh, he put he posted a a picture from trencher and and it, yeah it looks like it's a fold out uh a, a double fold out uh well it was like right at the start of image you know like one of the first two years of image so you know they could do anything with yeah the, this, is, know, this, this is this is amazing yeah this is amazing i I'd never heard of Trencher uh, until the last couple of days, and I have to I have to find this now. We didn't even talk about his Facebook post that he had his family post. Oh. I mean, that was a thing that oh my god, I think really caught people's eyes because first of all, some people just they didn't they thought maybe it was a joke. Yeah, you know, I would have. So he died on Monday, you know, I'm sure the family needed time, but that they 
put that out right on Wednesday, a day before New York Comic Con, that he knew, he knew the impact. So he writes on his Facebook, he had his family write this, I told them I was sick, anything not to go to New York Comic Con. Thanks, <laughs> Keith Giffen, 1952 to 2023. Bwa ha 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 He suffered a stroke, apparently, from what I heard. Uh. Uh, Paul Levitz uh, right. confirmed yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to have that as your epitaph, to have that as your announcement, uh-huh. people on Twitter, some people, you know, somebody called him a baller. Somebody called him, you know, like a maniac. <laughs> somebody said that is why he is the goat. You know, yeah. like yes, that's the way you do it if you're Keith Giffen. Yeah, you know. Anything not to go to New York Comic Con. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Uh, it's so frustrating that, you know, um, they always say, do things. Like, if you're going to do things, do things. Just do them, right? I've longed to do a major Keith Giffen retrospective, you know. I wanted to go through his early works that I've never read. I just wanted to, you know, he, like you said, one of my favorite creators. And it doesn't mean I can't still do that, but now it's different, you know, yeah. just mm-hmm. like with Perez, when Perez mm-hmm. passed, it's, it's different now. And um, one of my joys of podcasting is maybe possibly turning people onto certain comics certain creators um that's always the joy of it right you know what what kind of personal experience do we have with these with these comics with these creators and that we can share that through podcasting and um you know and it's like ah why didn't i do why didn't i do it when it was in my to-do notes you know probably eight years ago and i would have this this wealth of podcasting uh, I would have this experience with this creator who has given me so much joy, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. so, you know. Well, to your point, you know, give to give you some credit, Peter, uh, you did do that for me uh, just recently on, on, on one of your episodes of the Daily Rios when you talked about Keith Giffen's uh, 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 Reign of the Zodiac oh, right. comic right. book mm-hmm. that I had, I had never heard of. I, right. I had no idea that that even existed. And um, uh, because because you mentioned it on your show, I I immediately went out and and bought those back issues, intending to read them immediately. And it's been now I don't know two weeks, three weeks, something like that. It's been sitting on my desk here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it was it was at, at that time it was at the top of my list, and I I just let it sit there. And now I really wish I'd gotten to that because because um, I, I, I I'm I'm sure you said this in your episode. You know that was like one of Keith's. Uh, passion projects that didn't catch on for some reason. Right. And so I was really curious, uh, you know, what that meant to him by, you know, reading it re- and, and trying to understand what that meant to him and, and what, you know, you know, why, why didn't it last, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. He seems to have a lot of project as- projects, especially in the nineties mm-hmm. uh, that were, you know, they're amazing they're funny, they're clever, they're different. And I think even at one point I was like, as I was, um, so in my collection, in my inventory, I have a a dedicated space for Giffen. Oh, all of his comics uh, outside of the Legion are under G for Giffen, right? I did the same thing with Perez, all of his stuff is together, you know, um, and over the years, I've collected that stuff and then sold some things and then, re, you know, repurchased. But, you know, when you go through those titles that weren't necessarily meant to be miniseries, but just they only seem to hang on for like six issues, eight issues. It'll, Giffen has started to have a track record of, unfortunately, really creative titles that just didn't find an audience, you know, as yeah. great as Heckler was, as great as Vexed was, um, as great as Punks was from Valiant, which hardly anybody knows about, you know, um, there were just these, Reign of the Zodiac is the other one, you know, there's like these one-off miniseries that, uh, that's like, 
oh, you know, you wanted them to hang on, but, um, and he knew it too, because he, he would always poke fun at the end of um, final issues that were cut off, you know, he would inevitably make some kind of joke about low sales being canceled, whatever, you know, he knew, he was so aware of the business. And he was a, a self uh, described curmudgeon. So yeah. he, he could get away with all that stuff. So <laughs> You know, it's funny you, you say that because um, I, I the idea of Keith Giffen as curmudgeon is something that I did not realize until more recently. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd see, you know, people uh, in social media posts talking about Keith Giffen and making some references, right? But it wasn't, in, like I said, until recently where, you know, people, and, and, and if you go read some of the tributes, yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the things that they talk about is, is this how curmudgeonly he was. And, and, uh, I, I went and, and read some, uh, some of the, um, Q and a stuff in the Legion companion. Uh, and I've read it, I've read this stuff before, but I read it again so that I, it was fresh in my mind for us to, to talk about tonight. And it, that quality really does come out in, in his <laughs> voice in even, even on the written page. And then on top of that, there was the Keith Giffen. I'm not dead yet. YouTube channel that I think you turned me on to you. You posted that he was, he was doing this and I immediately went and watched. Unfortunately, only three videos were posted. I know. I, I hope that there's more and they're just, they just haven't put them up yet, but it's been. Yeah. According to, to YouTube. It's been five months since episode three was put out there, but my God, what an entertaining and curmudgeonly gentleman <laughs> Keith Giffen was. I'm telling you, if you, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't watched these YouTube videos of, of him, we, you know, he's, he's being prompted uh, by the interviewer or the, you know, the host, and I'm not sure what you would call that person. I just think kind of, it's, he's, I think it's his son-in-law. I think. I, I think you're right. Yeah. Son-in-law. And he's just kind of uh, uh, dropping um, pointers for Keith to, to focus on, but, uh, and, and, and Keith was also giving him, you know, a, a bit of grief too sometimes. So I've, it's, it's just totally there, but you know, he, he's such a, uh, charismatic in a way kind of guy that oh, yeah. you just, you just, I, I felt like he was like an uncle or something Yeah, watching those videos. And it just made me really want to, I wish I had known him. I yeah. wish I had, I had talked to him. I, and that's, but you know, just like with Perez, it's, it's one of those big regrets of mine that I, I never had that opportunity. I, I'd never gone to a con where he was, where he was mm. attending. I could, I could never do that. So that was actually something I was going to ask you if you ha ever met him. So I met him at a San Diego Comic-Con. So it was either 2006 or 2008, because those were the two years that I went. And he was having a panel, and I went, and it was you know, well attended, but it wasn't like in one of their huge spaces. I can't remember what it was about. All I know that he was on there, um, maybe he was talking about marvel stuff like annihilation at the time or maybe it was maybe it was a keith giffen specific panel I'm not, i don't remember i was sitting in the back so i was only maybe 12 to 15 rows you know there weren't a lot of um rows um so when it came, <laughs> when it came time for me to ask the question a question and i have no idea what i asked I stood up because I was all the way in the back and I wanted to make sure, you know, I've been to enough of these panels where it's hard to hear the person. People want to know who is asking the question, you know? So I just thought, well, let me just, you know, not stand, but sort of stand, but also like my leg on the chair, like just, you know, and almost right away, he was like, why are you standing? <laughs> he was, it was, I don't know if he thought like I was trying to do like some, press conference thing or you know it was like why why did you stay I was like, and I just said oh I just you know so people can hear you know and then I asked whatever question I asked I don't remember but I always remember that that exchange it's like why are you standing <laughs> yeah he, he, he seems like a, like based on things like that that I've, that I've read or heard or, or like I said in the YouTube videos he just seems like a guy who just says what he's thinking at the moment right sure. and and he's just like I, you know 
he, he doesn't care. He just, right. this is what he's, he's focused on. So he's going to talk about it or, or say it or whatever. So I, I kind of like that a lot. We interviewed him once on CGS as part of the annihilation stuff. So Andy Schmidt, we had been talking to him and we got Andy on and, and, um, Keith Giffen. And I think we had one of the artists on, I have a vague recollection of having to call ahead of time, um, maybe to make sure that the, the, the connection worked or something. And, um, on, uh, on Andre DeVito, that was the other one that we, um, that was the artist that we talked to. So I think like we had like a quick conversation just again, he wanted to have that conversation before the conversation, you know? Um, but I don't, I couldn't, I can't recall anything, but I do know that that episode is there. We did it back in 2006. Um, I think that was the only time we talked to him. I, I have to go back and listen to that again to see how, what he was like and, you know, um, was he his Keith Giffen self back then? <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, like I mentioned, I had, uh, I was looking through the Legion companion book and there's, there's some stuff here from Paul Levitz about working with Keith. Um, let's see here. Uh, he says, uh, Keith was the back, was the backup artist almost from the beginning of Paul Levitz's return to the Legion, his second run at the, the series. Um, and, uh, let's see here, uh, Keith and I had some old history from all-star, the all-star comics, which is, uh, I think that was Keith's first DC work was doing layouts for Wally Wood in, uh, all-star comics. Hmm. And, um, let's see here, uh, where we had, where we had gotten along, not particularly well, Paul says. So I was a little nervous about working with him again, but he had changed enor enormously in the years since. Uh, it was it was really some wonderful magic fun that we were able to play together. And he uh, Paul was asked, "What is, you know? What? Why do you think you you both worked out so well?" Um, let's see here. He he talks about how um, uh, uh, Stanley once said about Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. Uh, 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 Stan saying about his work with them, you know, for a few years there, it just seemed like we couldn't do anything wrong. And th that's, that's how he felt about uh, working with Keith. Um, but he also continues, uh, one of the peculiarities of comics as a collaborative medium is sometimes you're just in tune. The fertility of Keith's imagination, which is one of the truly great imaginations in our business, the passion he was able to bring to the work made me do better work than I probably would have done otherwise, uh, or that I would have done otherwise with, with other artists. Uh, whatever I was doing in terms of the way the stories were structured and the springboards were set up funneled his imagination in some productive directions. Although we didn't agree on everything during the course of the time, we just had a lot of fun playing, can you top this? Here's an idea. What if we do that? I don't know, but what if... What if we did it that way uh, with whipped cream on it? <laughs> okay. Uh. And it's funny because um, uh, some of that uh, can we, you know, can we top each other type thing? Giffen himself talking about his time working with Paul Levitz on the Legion, he mentions that too. So it's it was not a a one-sided uh, uh, opinion about the relationship. So right, and that was the same way with Jam Dimitrius, where they would bounce ideas back and forth, or or Jam Dimitrius would get the pencil pages and look at it and go, "I don't know what this is." All right, let me figure it out. You know, <laughs> um, I have some more here. Chris Cross, artist Chris Cross, um, his. Keith Giffen's work had so much range, and I can say, as I was an early teen reading and buying most, and I can say, as I was an early teen reading and buying most of his work, I finally got to jump on something with him as a pro, and that was The Midnighter, and he let me do what I wanted. I didn't get that freedom much. 
Here's the post that Colleen Doran says, I was 17, I was only 17 years old when he saw my art in a fanzine and called up and asked if I'd like to audition to draw the Legion of Superheroes. Boy, was he surprised when he rang my house and found himself talking to my mom, who told him I was still in school. <laughs> We've been best friends ever since. Uh, he is one of the funniest, best people I ever knew. And she did a few Legion things during the five years later run, too. I remember mm -hmm. that Element Lad story. I, I like what Tom King said uh, as well. Uh, a hero, a friend, an inspiration, an artist's artist, a writer's writer, which which we've been we, we we've been pointing out and talking about. A master of his craft, a genuine proud crank, which I thought it was that was a spit take inducing storyteller, a goat con panelist, and I, boy, I really wished I could have been at a a convention panel with him on there. <laughs> um, he created gods, then had the wisdom to laugh at them. Ross Ritchie posted a whole thing on Instagram. He said, without Keith Giffen, there would be no Boom Studios. Um, he said, Keith called me up. We struck up a friendship, and he offered me a chance to write a new series at Image called Dominion. I had never aspired to write comics. I actually tried to talk him out of it. The series didn't work, but Dave Elliott inked it and owned Atomica Press, which he wanted to revive, so I agreed to help. I called Keith and asked him to create a new series with J.M. DeMatteis, Hero Squared, which is really funny. I like that one a lot. It was a hit, or at least a big hit, for us. Keith spent the night convincing me to leave Atomica and start my own company. I spent the night explaining to him how many comic book companies fail how it was sh a sure ticket to disaster. The next morning I woke up and said, I can't believe a Hall of Fame living legend like Keith Giffen thinks I have talent and believes I could do this. I took a leap of faith, but never would have without Keith's dogged determination to make me listen to him and refusal to back down. And then when I started, he gave me my first slate to publish. No one knew who Boom was, but everyone knew who Keith was. Keith not only demanded I start Boom, he put his money where his mouth was and created series after series to, to support the fledgling endeavor. He stood by my side with me in the trenches. Thank you, Keith. You changed my life forever. And I read a lot of those early things like Tag and, um, uh, God, what else? Was, well, Hero Squared, I mean, and Planetary Brigade, Brigade I think, was a spinoff of that. Um, that, those were those were just they were fun they were a lot of fun i didn't realize that he had such a an involvement with boom at the beginning um you know i boom is not something that i really paid attention to i guess uh but there was a you know there was there was a time where you know i i i wasn't paying attention to like previews and stuff it was uh i was just getting stuff here and there so right that's unfortunate that i did not know about these things. I mean, they're going on almost 20 years now yeah. as a publisher. And then Mike Norton, huge influence to me and everyone. I was lucky enough to work with him a few times. He called me on the phone to describe a comic I was drawing rather than write the script. Then he told me a horrifying story about breaking his ankle and hung up with, there's a bottle of bourbon calling my name. So good. You mentioned Hero Squared, and that is that was that's a book that I actually bought recently, um, uh, the the collected edition, because I've been looking at it because he did that with J.M. DeMatteis, right? That mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like I I've not read this. It looks like a lot of fun. It's, the story sounds wonderful, um, but yeah, I just I you know it's one of those things where I you know I have it. I just haven't read it and like. Uh, we talked about Reign of the Zodiac. I, you mentioned the the Doctor Fate. I have the reprints of that uh, in the Immortal Doctor Fate four issue that they did. You know, because these are reprints from uh, the 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 backup in in the Flash that they mm -hmm. that they did. Uh, haven't read that. I haven't read Heckler. I mean, I I bought a bunch of these things within the last year, and I just been waiting to get to them. I mean, apparently. 
you know, Justice League 3000, Justice League 3001, yeah. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. supposed to probably has some Legion stuff in it. Um, Threshold, I collected that from New, you know, the New 52. Um, definitely the OMAC because I, I just love Oh, yeah. OMAC. Oh, my. That is, again, one of my favorite uh, Keith Giffen stuff. Um, wow. You know, it's, it's, you know, Dan DiDio has his name on it, but it, to me, it's, it's, it's pure Giffen. Um, and he's re that's, that's when he was really doing Kirby. Right. Uh, which, you know, makes total sense because it's OMAC. Right. And I just, I just adored that series. A lot of people just kind of, what I remember at that time was just like, because, because of Dan's involvement, they were just like poo pooing it. But I read, I got it and read it and just thought it was great. And I think that's probably the reason why he was tapped um, post-crisis for a lot of stuff for DC in terms of, it was almost like he was the, we want it not quite like what Jeff Johns did, where Jeff Johns could really, you know, break a character down and build him back up again. I mean, Giffen could do that as well, but he was more like, okay, do you have a radical idea you want to do with Dr. Fate? Is there something you want to do with Amethyst? Is there something you want to do with the Justice League? You know, well, that he, he, he um, really championed that, but it seemed like he was always like, he did an Aquaman thing. He did, he did so many things where it's like, if they were trying to squeeze new energy out of a character, he was usually the person they went to. I, yeah. I, I always think of him as their go-to guy for not only what you're describing, but also uh, kind of an architect for, for events. You know, you mentioned annihilation earlier. Oh yeah. Um, there was that he, he did. Um, oh, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on it uh, for DC. Uh, 52. I mean, he was, oh, oh, yeah. Fifth, yes. Fi yeah. He did the breakdowns for 52. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, uh, dang it. Uh, new 52 futures end. He was heavily involved with that. Uh, and I think also, uh, was it rain in hell? I know that was a, like a, a seven or right. nine issue right. mini series, but you know, things like that. And then obviously, I don't know if we want to jump right into this, but you know, more personally, the 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 legion five year later run yeah when you said about the impact he had on us in terms of the legion um as even though i jumped you know we even did an episode we did a, a, a tales episode on our first legion episode uh, legion comics and my first legion comic legion of superheroes 304 probably i think was also my first keith giffen comic mm. And knowing how his time on that book when I started reading was only, was he wasn't going to be on the book that much longer. Um, so he was on 304. His art style started to change almost immediately. Then he goes to the Baxter, but he's not on that long. So um, why I'm trying, you know, I was trying to think. I knew that artwork. I liked that artwork. Really, for me, his Legion stuff is the is the five years later. I mean that that's ah. to me like I because before that it really was ambush bug ambush bug the miniseries was the thing that really made me go. This guy's funny, you know. Yeah. Even though he was sharing um, creator credit, um, you know, with um, in terms of the writing. Uh, let me see here. It was, so he has plotter, pencil, penciler, Keith Giffen and scripter, Robert Lauren Fleming, which is usually the case, right? If, you know, same thing with J.M. DeMatteis on Justice League, you know, he, when he has a writing partner, it's probably because he has a story, but he doesn't want, want to do the, the actual dialogue, you know, but I think it was, I think it was all those appearances of Ambush Bug that made me love Keith Giffen, the artwork, but also the writer and the humor. So I had that Legion experience. Wow, that's cool. There's that Omen story. What's going on with his art? You know, I wasn't 
invested in le his legion artwork to the point that i couldn't allow for change you know because i know a lot of people hate that omen story because of it you know whatever um you know i was fine with it you know and then he jumps to the baxter but then he's gone you know so yeah i love the legion he's a part of that it's ambush bug that makes me makes me such a fan of his work he used to do backup issues and like back backup stories in Atari force and these weird little, you know, he would bounce around, bounce around. I'm reading a whole bunch of stuff from him, amethyst, you know, I'm looking at some other things that he did. He did like a random chapter in an all-star squadron annual. Um, uh, but then when I get out of comics and get back in and pick up that, those two issues of um, the five years later, the one that just says Venado Bay on the cover and the other one where fragments of the moon are crashing down on the earth. And I, I read those two issues off the shelf new and I went, what, it, what is going on? He's clearly the architects, one of the architects of, of this mad series, go back and get all the back issues. And I'm like, if I didn't love this man and I was like, he's a, friggin genius yeah 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 so that's where i think my legion uh when when i think of giffen as as and the legion that's my course so what mm. what's your course with with that so it's funny you, you 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 talk about it like that because that's how i as i was you know i was i took some notes on to prepare for this so i i you know i i can't remember numbers and stuff like that yeah <laughs> anymore but um that's how i i did it too it's like where, you know, when did I, when did I first encounter him and what, you know, trying to remember what, what did I think about stuff? And I pulled out, uh, my, my, my Legion collections, uh, that they put out, uh, in recent years and they, they, it contains all the issues of his, the, you know, the volume two, the Legion of superheroes, not the, not the Baxter, you know, the pre Baxter stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I was collecting the Legion at that time, uh, and it was about 10 issues after I started collecting month to month that uh, uh, they bring Giffen in and he's doing these uh, secondary stories in the issues. Mm -hmm. And Pat Broderick is doing the art for the main stories. And that lasts for, uh, I want to say three, maybe four issues, something like that. And uh, th then, they, then they transition him into doing uh, the main book. So I had um, about 35, uh, well, about, no, it's 33 issues of him on that title up through 313, which was the, the last issue of that before it switched over to Tales mm -hmm. of the Legion. Um, but he did, as I recall, he didn't, or that I saw, he, did, he didn't do any art for that, but he was listed as co-writer for those final, or his final two issues on the Tales. And of course, he's like you said, he he, he moved over to the Baxter uh, issues for a few of them. Um, but when I think of Legion, my Legion, it's that run, um, and, and that's the that was a nice thing of of doing this because I like as I said, I was pulling out, I pulled out those 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 collections. I was thumbing through them and looking at every issue where he's. He's doing the art mm -hmm. and, and he has, a, he had a couple of different inkers, Larry Malstead being one of them. Uh, and then they end up collaborating quite a lot during that Legion run. And uh, it's, it, you could see, and I don't know if it was the inker at first, but it was, it looked sort of like Broderick's work hmm. a little bit to me. And then once he comes on to the book himself doing the main stories, that, uh, you know, and it's, like I said, it started with 285, a few issues later than he's doing it. And then as early as uh, issue 291, I could see his style, what I think of now, when I, in my mind's eye, when I think about Legion and my love for Legion, it's that look, it's, it's the Giffen um, Malstead collaboration hmm. that is my Legion. And that's, he starts I think he starts showing that with issue 291. Uh, but it's that it's that run of uh, about 10 issues 
296 to 306. That is like, to me, that like the classic, the yeah. classic look yeah. of the Legion. And that's right, right about where you came in. Yeah. So, yeah. And we talked about it in that Tales episode. You know, I, I'm always jealous of anybody that picked up the Great Darkness Saga off the shelf and, and you know, other, uh, just experiencing his artwork, you know, it, he went through so many different changes, you know, and he freely admits it. I read an article years ago. Uh, you can find it online, I'm sure. It's an older article where he talks about, you know, I went to DC and I screwed up. And then I went to Marvel and I screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> and and a lot of it was for, you know, him being a, a cocky young artist or whatever. He was a Kirby clone of uh, an, an admitted Kirby clone, uh, especially, you know, when you look at like some of his Defender stuff. But then again, that was Marvel's thing, right? Like they pumped out people who they wanted people to look like Kirby or at least have the, the same energy. But he really was you know, pushing the Kirby stuff. Even Perez says some of his stuff is, you know, Kirby inspired. Mm, yeah. Um, then he morphs into that amazing um, Legion of Superhero, Superheroes artist that defines the future for me. Um, but then he goes through that art change. Then he goes really into his, um, um, what's that artist's name? Is it? Uh, Munoz? Munoz, yeah. He goes, you know, which again, that was the what the interview was about where he was like, yes, I admit I plagiarized. Not just copied, he was plagiarizing, you know, because it was, he said, it was, he was researching it and falling in love with it so much that it just became yes, part of him, part of his artwork. And he didn't know how to separate it. Yeah, you know? I actually have a quote, I think from that, that Probably article you're that mentioning article, yeah yeah he's he said you know this is the thing i i love about him is that you know he freely admits it yeah it's not like he's trying to hide it he's just but but here's here's what he said i had a bad incident with studying somebody's work very closely at one point and i resolved never ever to do it again i can get so immersed in somebody's work that i start turning into a xerox machine and it's not good there was no time i was sitting there tracing or copying no duplicating pulling out of memory and putting down on paper after intense study. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and when you do look at the two side by side, you know, you go, Oh, wow. <laughs> but then what happens is he then continues to play around with his art style. Those issues of Legion of superheroes in the Baxter run that we're coming up on post issue 50, we're going to see that we're going to see this, you know, this new um, push that's sort of like a marriage between what he was trying to do with Omen, March Hare. Um, there was that um, graphic novel called, I think it's Hell on Earth. So DC was doing, you know, they were doing those square bound graphic novels, but then they decided to do these things called DC science fiction graphic novels. Oh, right. Yeah. Where they took like stories from, I don't know, Harlan Ellison, Robert Block, whatever. And his was the first one with Robert Lauren Fleming again. And it was based on the story of Robert Block and it was hell on earth. And that, you know, like when you read that it's hard Munoz, it's, but it's also got like, you know, his very elongated figure, like when he, everything was long, everything was, you know, faces were long and there was a lot of blacks all over the place, black yeah. inks and, you know. Yeah. Um, but then when he, you know, what I'm excited for our Legion talk is I know what the five years later looks like, but that Legion stuff, that's how he gets there. So mm. I'm really looking forward to that. And then you can just keep going and going. You know, obviously he goes way to the extreme with Trencher from Image Comics, which is like this. I don't even know how to describe Trencher. I mean, it's it's like um, it reminds me of okay, this go on this journey with me. Sesame Street animation with like that pinball machine, one, two, three, four, five, right? right. Like with yeah. everything sort of neon, like, okay, you know, like 
it's kind of like that. It's kind of like old records from the 70s that had a lot of bubble, bubble. It looked like bu bubble deco work, you know, and and that's what Trencher is. But but like put through the thrasher and have, you know, some kind of like crazy heavy metal music stuff, you know, and just I feel like Tren Trencher's just I don't know what Trencher is, but. <laughs> <laughs> he decides to play with that for a long time and then and then he keeps moving his artwork again and, and then you know then there was that period of time when he went back to to kirby like during the new 52 stuff and omac and you know and mm. I mean, he just never stopped he just never stopped um doing what he wanted to do with his artwork and you either just went with it or you or you're like oh <laughs> yeah i don't want to read that well, you mentioned you mentioned the the omen story, right? Um, that he did mm -hmm. uh, before he left, and you know, I do recall that when I got to that, I'm like, "What the hell is this? Where where did Giffen go?" <laughs> and and you know, it's it's only years later where it's like, after seeing him develop into the artist that he did for a while on the Legion, and then in in other things that I had read, that I was like, "Oh no, this is this is good." I, I really like this, um, you know, even to the point, like uh, one of my favorite issues uh, of his is, and we covered this on the show already, but it's that annual, the who, who shot Laurel Kent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just, I just adore that annual um, for the art. It's mostly that and, and the humor. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of the, the, you know, that, uh, uh, that trademark Giffen humor that's in there, which also, by the way, you mentioned, and Bushbug, I do have the original miniseries, and uh, mostly it was it was because this is weird. To you know, at that time, I was thinking this this is really weird to me, and I, I and for the longest time, I wasn't sure that I liked it. And but now, you know, I looking back on it, and then uh, experiencing more of his work when he was allowed to do his crazy, funny stuff. Um, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was it was it was so different from anything else that I was reading from DC Comics from any comics publisher, and I, I always look forward. I always looked forward to experiencing more of that. And yeah. so when he would come back and do, you know, an annual or you know that Legion of Sub special that we we talked about too, and you know, yes, yes, I have I I am on record as saying I don't like what what Giffen did to my beloved substitute legionnaires but you know what i freaking love that sub special yeah it because because he put so much interesting things into it yeah it's just it's just a joy i think that dr fate mini series that four issue dr fate mini series from 1987 uh with jm dimitaeus david hunt was the anchor i think that's like the that that omen period i think that's w where he defined that look for me because i really like that dr fate it's very strange it's very you know the the way he does the um lords of chaos they're usually just smiles right like there's yeah, just big mouths and, yeah the big mouths yeah. and the weird smoke and the and the weird angles when they're fighting and and everything's you know um sometimes you don't see their face because again he's doing that muñoz thing so it's all blackened out it's silhouetted <laughs> out and I, I just i just adore that i love yeah. that stuff like and um i haven't read that ambush bug mini series i i don't even know but i i can tell i can there are two jokes that immediately come to mind one of them is um I think that character from Thriller, the villain known as Scabbard, comes into the Ambush Bug book because Robert Lauren Fleming was probably one of the scripters and that's he also wrote Thriller. And and it's just a bunch of panels and Ambush Bug is seeing him walk by him and he goes, holy Oak, Massachusetts, you know. And another one is <laughs> he's like he's creeping up against this this uh, this villain and the guy's talking about i don't know like the villain the, the criminal's talking about his mom or something like that and and that his mom named him homer and and ambush bug off panel goes oh 
your name's Homer? And he goes, yeah. And just like Bugs Bunny, he goes, great. I always wanted to hit a Homer and he hits a hits him with a bat. It's a silly joke, <laughs> silly joke. I still remember it to this day because it was, it made me laugh as a kid, you know? And um, yeah, uh, uh, that whole eighties period. And then, then he hits you, of course, with Justice League. Then he hits you with one of the other events, Invasion, right? He's one of oh, the right. architectures of Invasion. Yes. Um, the Legion 89 stuff. A Mega Man. He's already been on a Mega Man. He's, mm -hmm. uh, and then he does his Lobo stuff. And all of those things, my God, did he push the envelope on, on the ones that he was working on with those. Um, by that time, so let's see, Lobo number one came out in 1990. I mean, by that time, he, he's, he's Keith, Giff he's Keith Giffen to me, That that's it, you yeah. know? And then, as I mentioned, then you get into five years later and it's like, oh, well, come on, you know, I'm, I'm done. He's one of my favorites. Well, that, and, and yeah, same for me, but it was, it was, it was realizing, you know, not only do I love this guy's art in, in my Legion books, uh, even, even despite the fact that he's changing his style, um, then when he does five years later and he's, he's, you know, essentially writing it, um, you know, he's definitely the architect of, of that series. Then I was like, holy cow, this guy can do so much. Yeah. And then, you know, we, you know, we mentioned Annihilation earlier. Um, uh, and, you know, I think for the, you know, except with some exceptions, you know, after, you know, post Legion, he's, he basically does a lot of writing of various things. And, you know, he still does. I, I noticed there was a lot of like one, he, he would appear in like, uh, an issue of, you know, some title right. here and there and everywhere. And, uh, in fact, I have, I have, I had this in my collection. I haven't read it yet because it's just, you know, one of the many back issues that I've collected over the years. I, but when I was looking at, you know, what do I have in my collection that Keith Giffen has done, whether it's, 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 it's uh, doing the art or he's written it or whatever. And I, I found this daredevil issue, <laughs> an issue of daredevil. I, yeah. what that just, I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't quite understand that uh, daredevil 247. Uh, and so I had to, I had to read it last night. Um, uh, and so, you know, it, you mentioned that like the, 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 the black faces and all that kind of stuff, that's all in there. So that, you know, this came out in 87, late 87. And so, you know, he's still doing, or, you know, that's pre, pre five year later, but yeah, but, but it is, it is during that same time period where he's doing that kind of stuff. And it's so bizarre. It's like this, you would not expect this in a Daredevil comic. It right. doesn't, it, I don't know that it quite fits either, uh, the aesthetic of Daredevil, but you know what? It just, it was different and interesting anyway. Yeah. And so I just, I, I yeah, I just really like that kind of stuff. Um, you mentioned Ambush Bug and, and um, Lobo, but you know, he also, everybody's talking about this, but uh, co-created Rocket Raccoon, who's a huge multimedia star now for <laughs> an animated character. <laughs> um, uh, he had a hand in creating Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, he, some touchstone characters, not only for comic books, but also now in movies, you know, he had a hand in. Yeah. I sure as hell hope though, he got some sort of great compensation package for that kind of stuff, especially Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, yeah. And he was always someone who, you could always tell which character was his voice. Obviously, Am <laughs> Ambush Bug is yeah. such his voice. Lobo to a degree, um, which he said most, um, you know, there was another character that he did when he was younger called Lunatic that I, I've never read, but that um, I think he eventually did a Marvel miniseries called Lunatic, but Lunatic was, was also his thing, and then that he said he sort of split that character and one version became Lobo and I forget who the other, maybe the other version was Ambush Bug. Um, so he always seemed to find his voice, you know, Rocket Raccoon was kind of his voice and then Star-Lord was also kind of his voice 
later during annihilation like hmm. you know he had that temperament um that screamed giffen and um i'm sure there's so many others of uh, you know um oh you know like when you read a book and you're like oh there he is that's that's giffen that's giffen stand in right there you know <laughs> um would, yeah. would you say would you say uh uh maybe this is more uh speaking to to his humor style but uh i'm thinking of that matter eater lad issue spotlight <laughs> issue in the five year later run right so that, yeah that, i mean that that's him just doing looney tunes yeah you know? yeah yeah after after such a weighty <clears throat> um introductory storyline they he goes 180 to farcical comedy yeah well you know, which the, is that's the thing that people don't don't you know when they talk about the justice league bahaha era and like how funny it was and just how irreverent it was and they talk in interviews that some editors didn't want their characters in that book because <laughs> of that right, right? <laughs> but boy could that book spin very quickly to drama and emotion and they weren't afraid to do to, to have stakes in their stories you know and again this is all experience for him four or five years later like you mentioned you know you can have stories that are just crushing in that run right like that book gets bleak i think that's why people don't like it because it's so bleak and dark but then you have that matter leader, a matter eater, that issue. And you're like, this is amazing. This is, <laughs> thank you for doing that. You know, so giving us a little break or whatever. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, you know, it's one of the things that I had read uh, people talking about him was that, you know, his stories could be filled with all this humor and then it would take a really dark turn. And that seemed to be uh, a hallmark of his, his storytelling. Uh, in in some cases, so and you know obviously we see that in in a five year later, um, and I'm sure other things as well that I'm not remembering, but yeah, and and not to discount Tom and Mary Beerbaum mm -hmm. who were scripters on five years later, I believe they right. even said Al yep. Gordon would throw it. He was the an ink. He would also help to plot. So I un, you know, you talked about people who. Um, you said something earlier and it made me think of this. He used to have, I, I can't remember if he said it or Didio said it. They used to have regular lunches together. Mm -hmm. So you have this idea man having lunch with the head of DC comics at that time. Who knows what they, who yeah. knows how many things are actually because of Keith Giffen uh -huh. during Didio's, uh, Didio's, tenure you know and i i'm i'm on record as someone that you know i i um i think dan didio was actually very good for dc comics for a long for a long time not mm -hmm. only just in terms of the the stuff that was happening in the books but also um things that were going on uh, publishing wise like you know new 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 things you know like i i feel like you know now i want to go back and be like wow what uh you know, how many of those things were probably because of him, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I just looked at Dan DiDio's uh, Instagram and as of September 27th, hanging with Keith Giffen at World of Beer for DC Comics Trivia Night. Oh, I heard, I, I had seen that one, yeah. Uh, what was the other, um, another title that he wrote and Paco Medina was at least on the first couple issues. He wrote a Suicide Squad run. So like 12 issues in 2000 and started in 2001 and it just had that Keith Giffen thing, you know, and um, I'm fairly certain this was the run that, so Sergeant Rock was the lead guy for this suit. Instead of like Rick Flagg, they had Sergeant Rock. I was like, sorry. And I think at this point he was like a general or something, but then like one, I think the very last issue, not to spoil it, but just to kind of talk about, you know, like his crazy ideas, the guy, the character pulls um, his face off 
and throws it on the ground and then walks away and you never see who actually oh my god was <laughs> because everybody's like you know the whole thing with sergeant rock is he's the myth of it is um so he fights in the world war ii but he doesn't survive he's killed by the last bullet fired mm. in world war ii like that's supposed to be sergeant rock's legend but then dc started to mess around with like Jeff Loeb brought him back during his Superman Batman run. And then um, Giffen brought him back for Suicide Squad. And I used to always think, oh, is that Giffen's way to kind of say, no, you can't bring back Sergeant Rock. He can't exist, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to do this crazy thing with him. So he also wrote that Doom Patrol series, uh, which I have not read, one of the volumes for Doom Patrol. I, I haven't read that yet. Yeah. So that was, that's the 2009 series, apparently, because this, I think, they said that was announced at that year's New York Comic Con, or maybe it was San Diego. I forget mm -hmm. now. But anyway, apparently that was a, a favorite of his. He he said he long wanted to write that that mm -hmm. series, and I've not read it either. Um, I have a, I have a one of my best friends from growing up uh, is a huge Doom Patrol fan, so I'm gonna have to ask him what he thought of it. But and just like looking at other stuff, he's he his name is attached to. I've never heard of this. I don't think it ever popped in my head in terms of, like when I did a Keith Giffen search or whatever, something called Agents of Law from Dark Horse during their mm. comics greatest world thing. He only wrote five issues um, of a six issue series, but you know, okay, now I got to, you know, this is why <laughs> I wanted to do my great Keith Giffen retrospective so I could read all this stuff, you know, like yeah. you just know that, even if it's not wonderful, it's probably going to have one or two nuggets of that Keith Giffen magic that yeah. you're like, oh, there it is. There well, it here, is. here's an example. Um, he wrote this, and he did, he did it with uh, 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 Bill Keys Evely. This is from the Legends of Tomorrow miniseries. Oh. It's the Sugar and Spike story in that series. And that was so good. I haven't read I, that yet. I, I wanted that. them to take that and put it into its own series and do that because it was what you know we're you know idea man he he has he he reinvents characters um and that's what he did with with the the venerable sugar and spike and i thought <laughs> it was brilliant it was and it was it was just it was a lot of fun yeah um uh i will always be indebted to him for i and i assume it was I don't know how much it was him or co-writer Robert Lauren Fleming or Pat Broderick who did the art on this miniseries, but they brought back or they reimagined Ragman, yes, who's one yes. of my favorite, you know, not top tier DC heroes. And, and this is when they turned him into, um, uh, he, he, or he becomes a Jewish character. Um, uh, but the suit is a suit of souls now and and tied to jewish lore and just made the character have so much more opportunities for storytelling as opposed to what um what uh, uh he was before that and and you know and to this day it's it's continued so that you know we're talking i want to say what that came out in the mid to late 80s uh and so that version of ragman with the exception of a post new 52 version has been around for that long. Yeah. That is a good series, you know, and, and people talking about like how he really was the one that, um, uh, you know, Andy Schmidt certainly credits him as revitalizing Marvel cosmic with annihilation, but yes. Yeah. But really the, the Thanos miniseries that he takes over, from Jim Starlin in 2004 for me is really the start of it. So mm -hmm. there was a Thanos miniseries that, that Starlin was writing. The first six issues were, it was started in 2003. They were okay. And then for some reason, Giffen jumps on with Ron Lim. Ron Lim had already been drawing it with issue seven. And it's called the Samaritan storyline where, where Thanos wants to try to be a S Samaritan. And this is where you get the early, early foundation for, you know, um, Annihilation, um, those strange locations that were popping up in Marvel Cosmic, 
certain characters that would pop up. Um, that storyline for me was a revelation because, you know, Marvel Cosmic for the longest time and rightfully so was under the thumb of Jim Starlin. You know, I felt like once they got to doing yet another infinity, whatever, and another Thanos, like it was like, okay, what can we do new? And here comes Keith Giffen (laughs) redefining Marvel Cosmic with, with, you know, all of his creative team. And suddenly, you know, that from, from 2003 to about 2006, maybe, I guess, 2005, 2000, it it was amazing. And it was because of Keith Giffen. And I always felt like I was, I was so happy that they were willing to do something different that they were willing to take it away from the Jim Starlin stuff, which again, totally foundational. I get that, but new ideas, new concepts, new ways to talk about it. It doesn't always have to be heady. It doesn't always have to be trippy. You know, let's, let's try to do some real space opera science fiction stuff. And wasn't that the, the uh, origin point of the guardians of the galaxy characters in the films? Yeah, as well, sure. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they they transform some of those characters to be what we see essentially, right? In in the films, I mean, ultimately, when Bendis took over from Abnett and Lanning, you know, it was it's Bendis's version that the movie is more cut from, but that wouldn't have existed without everything that came before it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a great time for reading Marvel Cosmic back then. So he, cuz he did Thanos, he did Drax the Destroyer, mm-hmm. he did a miniseries for that and then eventually got on to Annihilation and all that other stuff. So Yeah. Uh, I mean there's just like like when I think I said this with Perez too. Um there's so many new things to discover that is only going to make it that much more um, amazing to be a a fan of their artwork or their their art, I should say. Mm-hmm. You know, the those men as the you know or as creators. You know, Perez is you know losing Perez, losing Giff. I I think I I mentioned to you I, this one was sadder almost because it came right out of the blue, and all of a sudden we were like, oh, yeah, you know. We've been seeing certain creators pass, you know, certainly Perez, we knew there was a, a time limit, you know, um, but I, I was really sad about this one. I was, I was really like, this one was like, oh, cause you knew the seventies was too, is too young. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's more there. And what did we lose? not only in terms of his imagination, but just what he knows about the comic industry, whether people want him to admit it or not, you know, like he (laughs) knows so much about the comic industry that all that information is gone, you know? Mm. And I feel like people need to, there's, there, you know, there's certain people who, who poo poo when people get too nostalgia driven with comics and podcasting and it's like yeah but these people haven't told all those their stories yet yeah there's not a definitive walt simonson career retrospective of everything he's done and and that he knows you know um there's no not that he probably would do it without getting paid or some kind of accolade but jim steranko has tons of stories whether they're true (laughs) or not you know and he's such a he's such a weirdo these days you know but again he's got a ton of ton of stuff jim starlin you know um um jim shooter has been doing a lot on his website but like bob layton you know like all these you know, even Colin Duran, Colleen Duran, you know, uh, Ramona Freyden is still around, you know, like, yeah, get these people on mic, get them in front of cameras, tomorrow's publishing, start doing more and more books on these people because mm. they are the people that have all this information that is, um, 
it's gonna it's gonna leave us, which is unfortunate. So. Speaking of tomorrow's, because uh, I know you have a pretty nice collection of back issue magazines. Uh, are there any that you can recall that are Giffen focused or have large content uh, that of focused on his stuff? Right. Yeah. They. I mean, there are several where they do interviews, especially with um, the team for Justice League International. You know. Um, I think they do several interviews. Um, here's one back issue 119. Um, it's an all Guardians of the Galaxy issue. So they do interviews with a whole bunch of people, but also with, you know, Keith Giffen is included in that. Um, back issue 39. Uh, has an interview interview with Keith Giffen and Robert Lauren Fleming all about Ambush Bug. So, got to get that one. Back issue number three, number three, with uh, Keith Giffen, J.M. DeMatteis, and Kevin McGuire all about Justice League. And also their follow-up, formerly known as the Justice League. I love that series yeah so okay i'm you're, you're probably gonna uh, disown me now but uh i've not read uh much if well hardly at all, anything at all of the Bwahaha era of justice league um uh so it was one of those things where i've just i've always meant to get into it and i never never have yet right. but i did jump on the formerly known as and i remember literally got rolling in some of those parts. I just thought it was so brilliant, so funny. And it, it, I think that was probably like the, the a big impetus of me going, yeah, I really need to go back and read <laughs> the J the, 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 the Bwahaha stuff, uh, you know, JLI stuff later. And I, so, yeah, I. And, and that creative team also did a defenders. Um, so, run. yeah, I, I did not know this until reading about this stuff and, and Giffen himself even says in something that I was reading about, I think maybe it's in the Legion Companion, um, where it's like, he, he tried this, whatever this defenders thing was, which I didn't know he, he had done and he felt like he failed. And, uh, I think maybe that's what it was. It was, uh, uh, him and JM DeMatteis and Kevin uh, McGuire. And Kevin, McGuire, that's right, Kevin McGuire. And it's like, okay, well, we tried this over here with this. Now we can retool it and do Justice League. And and so now I want to go read those Defenders issues because what, what were those like that, one, he felt like it was not a great uh, effort, but then was able to take that, turn it around and, and, and come up with what is considered by most, if not all people who have read it, a brilliant run of comic books. Yeah. I thought the Defenders, I thought it was fine. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. You know. I thought it was fine. And then they did, I remember when DC put out those Hanna-Barbera um, titles. And Giffen and DeMatteis were doing Scooby Apocalypse. And everybody was like, Scooby Apocalypse, Flintstones, eh, they're not going to be any good. <laughs> And they, you know, from, I, I haven't read all of the Scooby Apocalypse, but I know there are people out there who were like, that series was brilliant. Yeah. And Flintstones was, br not that he wasn't part of that one, but, right, Fl but Flintstones was brilliant. It was, yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's a huge chunk of comics that, um, that I need to read. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't read them all. That's for sure. <laughs> we could try. We can try. <laughs> I feel like his brilliance as a, a layout person, like what he did for 52, where he laid out every single issue of 52 and whether the artist stuck with it or not, you know, but still they were all there. And then DC put them on a web on their website. At one point, they put all the break. So I'm sure they're somewhere online. I'm sure you can find all the breakdowns. But I felt like looking at them and realizing that that's how he did comics, it, that spoke to me 
spoke to the little part of me that, you know, when I was a kid, like you, like when we were kids, we did our own comics, you know, like, I feel like what a, what an interesting way to get your point across. What an interesting yeah. way to um, hone your craft. That's, a, that's, there's one thing that, I, that that series 52 showed and, you know, you went through all those issues. His storytelling is so amazing to go back to five years later, the sequential storytelling, the impact of whether he was doing nine panel grids or throwing a splash page at you or, you know, just how many people have followed that and learned from that. And, um, you know, how many people could learn from that? You know, there's many, many artists who you look at their work and it's like, well, the pictures are, pretty but there's not much storytelling going on there's no mm-hmm. there where the how do they exist in the space where's the um staging you know what's how does this person's physicality different from this person uh who's taller and who's shorter who's you know like little things like that there's a lot of people that don't pay attention to that stuff at all mm-hmm. and that's why burn and Perez and Simonson and Giffen and, and, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on. That's why they are the giants. And that's why Neil Adams, that's why we're still talking about them when they, and, and we're revering them when they pass away because they added so much to this art form that we love. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss, not having his voice. Out yes, there. that's funny. I, that's the word I was exactly thinking when you started saying that. Yeah. Anything else you want to throw in here? Uh, I have some things here from uh, words of Giffen's um, <laughs> from the companion I, I thought might be interesting. Uh, so he was asked, uh, talking about the Legion, his, his time on the Legion, uh, did you pay attention to how popular the book was becoming? Yeah, because I always had one eye on knocking the Titans off its perch. <laughs> yeah. Stay ambitious, I just thought. Boy, let's take one month to do that, to knock it off. We never did, of course, because Marv and George were the juggernaut back then. They were unstoppable. Uh, they talk about uh, him. He When he was first drawing the Legion, he was also drawing the Omega Men. And he said, yeah, that was a mistake. Because he, he he was burning the candle at two ends. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he was asked, "When did you start to feel like the title was yours to play around with?" He said, "Not until it became mine to play around with." <laughs> I love his, I love his his uh, his attitude. Karen Berger called me into her office and said, "Paul's going to be leaving the Legion. Would you like to take over?" Uh, when you're not collaborating with somebody in a book, especially somebody who's had a long run on the book. Who am I to come in and go, now, Paul, we'll do it this way. You defer to the guy who has the most experience with the book. And as long as the guy is doing good work, which Paul was, I had no problems with it at all. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the Legion. I probably would have continued doing the Legion. Everybody wonders what happened. Why did you leave the Legion the first time? Was there friction? Was it because you and Paul started fighting? Nothing could be further from the truth. I left the Legion the first time because... I did that Legion poster. Oh, we haven't mentioned that. Uh, 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 and fried myself. After I was done with that poster, I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. And sort of wandered off. Which, in other things I've read, he that's what he did when he was younger. When he, when he, when he was done doing something, he just, he just left and went mm-hmm. to do something else. Mm-hmm. Which obviously caused him problems uh, mm-hmm. working at DC and Marvel. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway... Um, uh, wandered off. Uh, the Legion was a good time. I often wonder what it would have, what would have happened, had we not peaked early with Great Darkness. After Great Darkness, everything was. Can you top that? There's that, that ongoing theme with him again. And then, um, yeah, here we go. And then finally, what I have here, uh, are there any Legion stories from your first run that you wish you had a chance to do over? I guess the latter issues of the run, when I was running out of steam, I'd like a chance to go back and do those right. And when it comes to beyond that, definitely the magic wars. Hmm. 
which we're, we'll get to. Uh, I'd like another chance at it because I think I really dropped the ball on that one. Well, that's a bad way to end this. <laughs> Let's talk no, about it's that. It's a good way. It's a good way because, you know, it goes to show that he's, he's, you can't love your artwork so much that you can, you can't, oh, yeah. it, you know, and that you can't improve. Right. And he always seems like, based on everything I'm reading and what people are saying about him and Mike's own experience with his work, he just seems like a guy that was constantly striving to to do things more and better and different, especially the different part. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I love about comic books generally, because we have so many different writers and artists and artisans uh, involved with the creation of these things, these stories, that you know, you, I don't, you don't get that level of variety in any other medium. Right. And with maybe the exception of music. Um, but uh, seeing that on an individual level is also one of the great joys when you, when, when you discover an artist and, and then you, you follow them through their career and you see them grow and you see them change. You may not like everything, as I've, as I've known, as I've noted. Um, but you know, you could come back later as I did and, and, and go, wait a minute, I was wrong. That that's really interesting. Now I, now I have a whole new dimension of their work to dis, to uh, discover, appreciate and, and, and fall in love with all over again. So, yeah. 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 Well, as he used to always have ambush said, say, bite me, fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the perfect way to end this. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, so as we mentioned in the top, we wanted to do this because when you get to the next episode we release after this, you're, there's just no mention because, as we said, we, are, we had already recorded before we heard this news. Um, I imagine... Once we get beyond that, and when, as you said before, once we get into his return to the book, it's definitely going to have a whole new, yeah, um, whole new and, angle to it. Maybe. Yeah, and I have been so looking forward to that too. Yeah, Re yeah, revisiting. Like I said, I, I didn't care for that work at that time, and and now I'm coming at it thirty something years later, and and uh, better appreciating what he was trying to do then. So yeah. I'm I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we haven't talked about, you know, the future of this, this podcast, but I mean, we know invasion is coming down the road, you know, um, and with invasion comes that Legion series, the other Legion mm -hmm. series, mm -hmm. you know, other podcasters have, have covered all that stuff. And, you know, who knows what we, what we're going to do, you know, after the Baxter run, because we're still, you know, two plus years out, you know, yeah. but there's a lot of Keith Giffen stuff that I know we can get to. So, you mm -hmm. know, it'll be fun to, to keep, to keep his name going, which um, really, you know, his work will exist and continue and new people will discover, hopefully some of the older work. And um, if you've hear some of these titles that we've been spitting out and you've, you've never read them, I'm sure they're probably on the DC app. Uh, I'm sure you can get many of those comics cheaply in the back issue bins, you know, um, some of his mini series or series that didn't last book of fate when, you know, we didn't mention book of fate and, um, apparently he did some other valiant work that I didn't realize he's done some image work that I have yet to read. I mean, it's just so much. So, yeah. Yeah. That was one thing I did. I was like, I hope none of those retailers during New York Comic Con they better not have like jumped the price on some oh, of his books and be so. Pissed. You know somebody, some know. Did, some of them did. If I would have walked around, if I would have been there and walked around and saw that, I would be like, "You suck!" Shame, 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 shame. <laughs> <laughs> so, any last thoughts? I, uh, it's, it's getting. You know, I, <laughs> I'm getting up there in age too. Uh, uh, and I'm only, I'm less than 20 years younger than Keith was when he died. And so, you know, things, the, these, uh, these deaths in, in this medium that I love so much, uh, these, these people 
whose careers I've followed, comics I've collected. It's just, uh, it's, it's getting harder to, to, uh, to see this. And, and we've had a lot in the last year, year and a half. And, uh, I, it's, you know, just, you know, it's an obvious, uh, unfortunate truth of, <laughs> of our humanity, but it's just, it's, it's, like I said, it's getting harder for me to, to, to kind of accept and deal with this, with yeah. this stuff. Yeah. So I, yeah. Uh, I, anyway, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy that I, I have those, those Keith Giffen comics that I can go to and, 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 and look at and appreciate a new again. Um, uh, so at least there's that. Great. What about you? Oh, you know, you know, it's sad. It, uh, uh, I think some of it is, is just, um, like you mentioned age. Um, and some, some of them are passing that that's, you know, like Carlos Pacheco, you know, we didn't expect that and Tim sale and, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of people that, um, some we knew some, some were just age, but then other ones were just like, what, you know, and it's going to, it's going to happen more and more because, you know, especially our generation of reading comics when, you know, in this, whether it was like late seventies to the nineties, that generation, that boom of creativity. And most of those people are still working in comics because they have a name or they have a draw or whatever. Um, uh, I think that's why it affects some of us the way it does is because it's like, oh, they don't get to live forever. What? You know, like, when you know. Well, yeah, you know, in that sense, they're, they're kind of, I might be overstating it. They're kind of like family, extended family, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. Because there were times that I felt closer to their creations than I did some members of my extended family. <laughs> and 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 their work got me through childhood uh adolescence adulthood for that matter sure um yeah. you know and it's just it, it there's such a an in, integral part of my life that yeah when when we lose one of them you know it 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 stings it hurts yeah well we love comics keith love comics mm -hmm. and uh you know, go and read some Keith Giffen comics. That's yeah. That's all you can say. Because right. you you won't be disappointed. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for indulging us, letting us uh, talk about that, listeners. Hopefully, you enjoyed that, and or or have your own memories. I should say. You know, um, let us know. Let us know what uh, you know what you think of Keith and, and the Legion or just Keith Giffen in general, uh, you can send email Peter at the daily Rios.com or uh, make sure you tell us what, you know, your favorite uh, Keith Giffen comics are too. Yeah. Uh, especially if ones that may, we may not have mentioned because uh, there were a bajillion of them, but you can, you can also email me at longboxreview at gmail.com. Great. And again, you'll hear the next episode after this, whenever it's released, uh, we will go back to uh, the regular Legion title, and uh, and then after that, uh, you know, we'll just we'll just keep going. Yep. Have a good night. Bye bye. Not everyone's going to like what you do. Not everyone's going to like what you do. And as long as I liked what I was doing and uh, felt that I was doing a fair job, in other words, just doing my job and putting it out there and doing the best I could. Well, I, I can't control it. I, I, I'd love it if everyone loved my work. But no, I mean, I've, I've uh, the fans I ran into at conventions, well, even if they didn't like my stuff, they wouldn't come out and go, I hate your stuff. They'd pull you aside and go, well, you know, this and that and the next thing. They were extremely polite and just uh, extraordinarily uh, well-behaved. <laughs>